In the 1960s, there was a Swiss psychologist named Jean Piaget, and he did an experiment. He wanted to know at what age children learned object permanence. The idea that if they couldn't see something, was it still there or did it just vanish? And so, you know, you'd be like, well, how would I know whether a kid can realize something's still there or not? And he came up with the idea that he'd take a ball and he'd hide it under the blanket. And if a kid started like rummaging through the blanket looking for the ball, they, they must still think that the ball's there and they're in search of it. And so he did this over and over at different ages of kids and learned that for him, his studies showed that it was at eight months where suddenly a child might be able to um, have this object permanence, knowing that something is still there even when you don't see it. And so I was thinking about how um, this kind of ability to know something's still there when we don't see it seems related to an anxiety that we have, which is around um, relationships and people. When I'm not with them, do I still feel like, close to them? Do I still feel like uh, attached to them? Do they still love me? Do they still care for me? Uh, I think parents know about object permanence through uh, when their child cries in the crib, realizing, wait, where's mom and dad? Am I alone or, or what's happening here? And so uh, we, we have this fear of losing people and we start wanting to attach to them and really cling to them and hold on to them. And so we, we do something that we call smothering. Smothering like, oh, well, I, I, I like something, I, I love someone, I have an affection for someone. And so let me show it to you by clinging so tightly and never letting you go and holding you there. And when we talk about smothering, we talk about the need like that you're attaching to someone and that your needs end up mattering more than the person's needs that you're attached to. So smothering is not usually meant to uh, elevate or improve the life of the person being smothered. It's to feel that, that great closeness you want, that control that you want. And there's all sorts of versions of smothering. If you've ever had a child running around a household yelling, mama, 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 and it never stops. The child wants the mom's attention. They want all of the focus. They want to cling to their mother and they don't want anyone else to cling to mother. I get mother. And as you have more kids, that gets harder as everybody wants attention and fights for it. And I want it myself. Um, and I also think about the way that this grows over time that sometimes kids get frustrated, like, well, why is it my parents don't seem like they don't have their own friendships, they're not building their own relationship up. And, and there's this thing that happens that as you smother your parents over time, maybe they lose sight of their spouse, or maybe they lose sight of friends because they have invested so much time in the child that they've lost some of those other relationships because we demand so much. Um, smothering doesn't just a one-way street. Sometimes parents smother kids. And we, we sometimes just rush in. I'm gonna fix every problem for my kid. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna overwhelm the situation. I'm gonna show up, I'm gonna fix things with the teacher, with the coach, whoever it is. And I don't like let my kid wrestle with these things or deal with things or potentially fail. I've gotta make sure everything turns out correctly. Or maybe you've felt or you've, you've experienced um, the idea that, well, you know what my kid should do for a living? I would love for them to go to this school Anybody ever wanted their kid to go to Michigan or Michigan State? <clears throat> You've given them a pipeline of which direction they need to go? <laughs> or when you get there, what career do you pursue? I don't know about that one. Well, maybe you try this one. But you know you're so good at, and you start trying to push and, and, and move people in the direction that you want them to go. And some things that feel like they're loving and you say, well, you mean the world to me. I don't know what I would do without you. And then the child has felt like they've got this burden of responsibility that your worth, your value, your life is on their shoulders. And that, how do I make those decisions? How do I live up to that? Or how do I run away from it? We do this in relationships in our lives, whether friends, boyfriends, girlfriends, spouses, uh, you know, when a, when a partner gets unhappy or irritated every, unless they're like always getting the attention that they need. They just always need the attention. They complain that you're not spending quality time with them, even if you're spending your whole day with them. You, they've been monopolizing your time schedule and yet you still don't feel like it's enough. Uh, you hear it in the phrases, oh, I'll, I'll change them. 
you know, I, I know that they're this way now, but you know, long term, I can make them different because I, I don't value kind of who they are, what they are. I, I want them to be what I need them to be, and I'm going to change them. Or how about never ending texts and phone calls to ensure, are you still thinking about me? Are you still thinking about me? Hey. Still thinking about me? Or in our online world of posting things about your private life and kind of like manipulating a situation of like um, in the midst of a dispute, kind of airing that out for everybody else to give comment and feedback for. We live in a world that sometimes doesn't know how to healthily love each other and we smother people. I think we're used to the idea of people hating people and hurting people, but it's a lot harder to notice when we like people or love people and we hurt them. And so our story is in the midst of this kind of smothering. And if you've ever been on that journey, you might maybe lack some confidence because someone else has been swooping in for you or making decisions for you. You might not know who you are. You've lost a little bit of yourself. You might have a little bit increased anxiety. Every decision, everything is, is uncertain. Maybe you have anger, acting out, lying because you, you're just tired of the situation, trying to manipulate it. But it's exhausting. And I would imagine Joseph at some point started to get a little exhausted because he had the fortunate problem of always being like the apple of the eye of everybody in his life that's in power. His dad loves him. Let me get you the best coat ever. And this sounds like a great idea until his brothers are jealous and envious and want to kill him. And in slavery, he's been sold off to Potiphar. He's living in an Egyptian house of a higher up official. And Potiphar's like, man, everything Joseph does, does amazing. And I'd like to have a fortune. I, he seems to do really well. I want to do really well. Let me empower him so he can do everything. And he's celebrating Joseph, and Joseph's alongside of him, so much so that Potiphar's wife is now also in the same space of, I sure love Joseph. Joseph seems like the most amazing guy. Uh, I don't remember the company name. It's slipping my mind. But the most interesting man uh, commercial lines where they would just like catch you on this, like, like the jack of all trades. They can do everything. They're just Dos Equis. There it is. The most interesting man. And he's got a nice beard. He's, you know. Joseph is the most interesting man in the room. Uh, the text tells us uh, that he was, like, it comments about he was 17 earlier in the story. It later comments about his looks and that he's, like, handsome. And when it's commenting on his handsomeness, uh, it's a, it uses a phrase that gets used of no other guys in Scripture. So Joseph can kind of walk real tall and be like, that's right, I'm the most handsome man in this text. And... It, I, I kind of like this note because this note about Joseph and his stature and how he looks is also used of his mother. And that might also lend clues to why Jacob is so attached to Joseph as he reminds him uh, something of the mother that he had lost, his wife that he had lost, Joseph's mother. This well-built and handsome Joseph. This, this well-built, handsome slave in Potiphar's house suddenly becomes... Uh, the object of attraction for Potiphar's wife. Now, I want to tell you that Jewish tradition and some traditions name her Zuleika. And I just like when we get a no-named person given any name, and it's probably not Zuleika, but Zuleika is a pretty fun name. So if you want to remember Zuleika, that's a fun one. Uh, but Zuleika is a person of power in her house. Like her husband has power, they've got a uh, high status, and this person of power suddenly becomes so entrapped in lust that she becomes a slave to a slave in her household. And she approaches Joseph, and she's done a lot more looking than talking to Joseph, because the Hebrew text only gives her two words to say. It becomes three in English. But she says, lie with me. And that's the only words we get of her to Joseph. We don't get to like quibble on what was her motives. No, she's very uh, direct of what she wants. And it says that Joseph's like, hey, pushes back. But she's not going to give up. She's going to keep trying and keep persisting and keep pushing and keep overwhelming Joseph. We just 
rarely think about someone liking us and being attracted and, and like feeling positively about us causing a whole bunch of problems. But this is what Joseph's going through. Now, if you wanted to um, imagine some responses to smothering in your life, Joseph gives us some helpful advice. The first thing that Joseph does is he doesn't ignore the problem. I think for some of us, we are conflict avoidant and some of the anxiety. Maybe if you've had a, a helicopter smothering parent who's swooped in and fixed your problems for you, you might be like, you know what? I, sometimes I kind of like when someone else swoops in and I don't have to deal with this. But Joseph doesn't act like, oh, uh, what? Uh, I didn't hear you. Doesn't ignore, doesn't, um, were you talking about um, so-and-so and, and just kind of like move on with the day? He's quite upfront with her and he addresses her straightforwardly. And Joseph creates and announces boundaries for himself. And I think that's not easy for people to do, that we feel when our boundaries get broken, but we don't always announce them to people and like say, hey, just so you know, I need this space. Or, hey, when I'm getting up in the morning, I just need a moment. Let me get my coffee. Let me, let me read through some messages. Let me do something. I just need some space. Can I just have that space? Joseph gives her three boundary lines. He says, how could I do this for you? And, and I'll read a few verses just to remind us of Joseph's words here in this text. Joseph refused and said to his master's wife, look, with me here, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my hand. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph is much more long-winded than Potiphar's wife was. She's got two words, hey, lie with me, uh, three in English. Joseph's like, okay, let me set some boundaries for you. How could I ever do this? First, I like my job. There's a version of that that's at the beginning of the story. I've got a pretty good position. Your husband trusts me. I've got everything in the household other than you. Welcome to me. I get to help run this place. I don't want to lose trust. I don't want to lose this thing. He knows what it's like to sit in a well and feel like life is over. He was sold. You don't know where you're going to get sold into slavery. And you're like, if I'm going to be a slave in this place running things here, I'll take it. I'm not going to jeopardize that over this. And even more than that, you, he even addresses her as he talks in the text, it says, talks to his master's wife. Uh, it's very clear about her relationship and, and why this is wrong. Now, um, part of the language of this is going to start to feel a little bit too ancient mindset for us in that uh, Potiphar's wife is like his belongings, like she belongs to him. Um, I think we'd still modernize that of like, you are meant for someone else and you have a relationship with someone else and I don't want to rupture that relationship with someone else. And so I don't want to break up you and your spouse. I, I don't want to violate that for you guys. So I, I like my job. I think you guys should keep your relationship. Let's keep that separate. And third, how could I do that before God? I think sometimes we assume like God was the first one, like first thing on the list. Well, you know, God says not to do this. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. Um, but that gets the third one on the list. Like, how could I do this wicked thing? Like, how could I live my, with myself? Like, God doesn't want this for me or for us. If we were meant to be together, the relationship would not encounter in this way. There would be a healthier, better version of being able to approach each other. And so Joseph creates these boundaries. Like, I can't do this. I, I like my, the trust I get in my job. I, I, you know, you're, you and Potiphar are together, and God doesn't want this to happen. And so he creates those boundaries. And I, I think for us, we have to think about like, what boundaries do we need? Because you can feel those pains, you can feel hurt, you can feel like you've been overwhelmed, but it might be worth time to just sit in prayer and like journal and think about, what is a boundary line that I need to make? Like for my own mental health, for my own well-being, for my own like enjoyment of life, what boundaries should I set? And who do I need to share those with? 
probably don't need to share them with everyone who's not violating those boundaries. But if there's a situation where someone is trying to keep pushing past that thing that you need, don't ignore it. Approach, say, hey, here's what I need. Now, it doesn't go super well for Joseph, and it might not always go well for us. Sometimes we can share, this is the boundary I need, and the person will keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And that overwhelming, smothering feeling is overcoming us. And at some point, she gets frustrated enough that she kind of escalates things towards physical aggression, and she like grabs hold of him. So she's escalated her verbal request to physical attachment. And Joseph does the next thing that we might need to be aware of. If you're feeling smothered, sometimes you just got to get out. There are times where you're like, I, but I, I appreciate this relationship. I like this environment. But like sometimes when your boundaries are broken far enough, you just have to leave. And I appreciate that Joseph doesn't like think about leaving. He just leaves. And the text is like his, his garment is left with uh, Potter's wife. She's like, she like grabs on him and he leaves, she, he leaves and the coat's still there. So like she's holding on pretty hard for, for him to just escape without his coat. Uh, and so he leaves his coat behind. And the Hebrew scholars kind of talk about the, the verbs that they use about his leaving, where it seems like he flees and then like maybe on his way out the door, then kind of like wants to walk normal of like, I got out of the situation, but I don't want to like, cause a scene. So once I get outside, let me act a little bit more normal, but it's still getting out of this situation. So, and so some of us have some situations that maybe you need to just get out of. Uh, if someone is just continually pushing you into some unhealthy um, areas that, that you've set up boundaries, you've talked about, and they just don't respect it, sometimes you have to get out of there. Now, the challenge for Joseph is that this situation was not an equal power dynamic. Uh, she has more power than him. And there would have been plenty of servants and slaves in Joseph's situation who appeased their master and, and would have gone through with it, not because they wanted to, but because they felt so trapped. And so Joseph gets out, but Potiphar's wife and all of her desire and, and attraction and jealousy starts turning into rage and anger. And she decides wait a minute, I've got a pretty good story I can tell. Why do I have Joseph's robe? Or if someone goes outside and is like, why is Joseph walking around without his robe? What's the story? And she's going to lead like down a line of kind of attacking and lashing out at Joseph, which I think is the sign of, of smothering kind of to its extreme. It, it's the visibility of the fact the thing I wanted and I was trying to do wasn't about the other person. I wasn't trying to just benefit them. I wanted things myself. And if I don't get what I want, now I'm going to lash out. And so she schemes up the lie and she goes to the other servants in the household. And she has a slightly different version in the Hebrew of what she accuses Joseph of in that one. And that one, the text highlights, says that Hebrew that went in here with us, he tried to sleep with me focusing on the foreigner status, that foreigner. And don't we know how easy it is for people to want to scapegoat foreigners and people to just buy whatever made up statistics or, or claims we want to make about people who aren't like us, who don't look like us, who don't talk like us. And so she uses her anger to be like, that Hebrew guy, can you believe him? And the, the same person who was incredibly attracted and wanted that Hebrew then can vilify them and act like they are less than. And when her husband comes home, she focuses instead of the, like the Hebrew focus, it becomes that slave you brought us. So she's just derogatory to Joseph. He's that Hebrew, that foreigner. He's that slave. He's that nobody. How dare you bring, you brought that slave into this household. This is your problem, Potiphar. And her vindictiveness causes Joseph to end up being thrown into prison. Uh, interesting random fun fact, Egypt is one of the, the most ancient places to actually have prisons. We kind of take that for granted. Um, but they created spaces to confine people uh, in most towns that they had. And so Joseph is thrown into prison, which wouldn't have been a situation that happened back home. Uh, they would have figured out what price to pay, what, what would be your restitution. 
in Egypt, you're thrown into a prison. But Joseph is in prison free of the smothering of Potiphar's wife. And that's the oddity of the story is if you've ever felt like you're stuck in a toxic environment, you're just being overwhelmed. I imagine Joseph felt a hint of feeling free in the midst of being out of it. And they might have bound his hands, they might have bound his feet, but he knows that he walks with integrity that in that moment he chose the right route. He hadn't chosen the right route all of the time in the story. Sometimes he lords himself over people, sometimes he's proud, sometimes he's you know, just kind of arrogant. But in this moment, he speaks truthfully for himself, he speaks rightfully, and he still ends up in prison. You might do the right thing for yourself, you might create boundaries, you might have to escape something, and you still might feel like you're getting all the consequences. And that brings us to, I think, the good news of this story. This is the only chapter in Joseph's entire story, Genesis 37 to chapter 50, in which the personal name of God shows up to Joseph. It says four or five times in this chapter, the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph in Potiphar's house. The Lord was with Joseph in prison. The divine promise to his ancestors, to Jacob, to Abram, was, if you follow after me, I will be with you. Where do I go? Doesn't matter. I'll be with you. Where are you going to be? Doesn't matter. I'll be with you. And so Abraham goes off and travels across the world and comes to a place and God's presence is still with him. The God of Haran somehow is the God in Israel. When Jacob is fleeing for his life because he tricked his father and, and he made his brother mad and he's on the run, he goes and he has a dream in the middle of the desert and he has a dream and realizes God is here too. And God was with him. I think it's very interesting that this Joseph cycle doesn't talk about God's presence with Joseph in the midst of like celebrating his nice coat, it's like, hey, I'm going to lord over you. Doesn't say it there. It's when he's wrongfully thrown into prison and he's wrongfully sold into slavery, when he's wrongfully accused, when the world is wrong against him, even though Joseph didn't do anything to deserve that, God hears him, God is with him, God is not abandoning Joseph. And so if you've ever worried about, like, how do I survive? How do I get out of something what is life on the other side? God is on the other side. God is with you along that way. God is with you in the journey. And so God's presence is nothing like Potiphar's wife's presence or Potiphar's presence or Jacob's presence. All of the people that have smothered Joseph throughout the story be like, what can I get out of Joseph? I love Joseph so much, but I want something out in return for this. God is open-handed. God gives Joseph dreams, but not specific words. You got to interpret it. What's happening in the stream? How's this going to be? He gives him imagination, but doesn't give him, this is the exact path you've got to walk, Joseph. You better follow this exact step. God is with him and allowing Joseph to navigate life and wants what's best for Joseph. And God wants what's best for all of us. And so if you are, are nervous about the next step for yourself, we can trust that God's presence is a reason to trust and a reason to give up some of those anxieties that are holding us down. And so personally, what do we feel that we are being smothered by? What do we need to, to get rid of? What do we need to set up healthy boundaries? How can we embrace the possibility for ourselves that God is opening up? in us and through us. And so I, I hope that we might feel encouraged and invited into whatever uh, a possibility God opens up for us instead of this kind of like demanding, precise, this is exactly the way I need you to go forward today. God is opening up and welcoming dreams and imaginations for you to walk into. You might also think about who in my life might I be smothering? because we always want to be the victim and the hero, but sometimes we are the ones pushing some other people down. 
And is there anybody in my life that I need to give a little bit more healthy boundaries to, that I need to, to empower them, celebrate them, but not control them, not speak of them in a way that, that tries to puppet them? As a community, how do we be a space that is uh, about hospitality without being smothering? This is a tricky thing for every church that is small. Uh, there, there's a, a thing, if you're a guest, you, you come in and people are like, well, we would, we would love for you to be here. We want you to be here, you know, and you can feel smothered really quickly. And I feel like sometimes it sounds like a negative when I say like, um, we would love you to be wherever God is inviting you into. And we hope that that could be with us, but like, we don't want to force you to be in a place that's not actually what's going to help lead you to life or wherever God is leading you. And so sometimes God calls us to other places and that's okay. We don't have to feel like we control each other and that we need to pigeonhole people and push them into certain things. But we want to be a space that is free to follow God, that is free to live into uh, the possibilities God has invited us into. I appreciate that every week with the cafe, that's what we do. We make a space where we just welcome people. And we don't want to just preach a sermon at you. We don't want to just kind of like dictate a whole lot of stuff. We just want you to know that you're loved. And that's what we hope to do in our personal lives. That we invite people into love, but we're not trying to shove things down on people. And so today we are all invited, whether you're parents, children, partners, friends, can we love without smothering today? And know that we are loved and that God's love for us gives us space and freedom and possibility and empowers us to be in conjunction with God, to, to write that story with God. And that is good news. And it shouldn't feel like guilt and shame and, and all of the weight that we sometimes put on ourselves or we sometimes feel put on ourselves. And so let us live freely with joy and not the pain and the weight of smothering. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you so much for your grace, your mercy, that there are times where we have not loved you well. There are times we haven't loved our, our neighbors, our friends, our family well. There are times where we've controlled one another. There are times where we've pushed one another. And so we appreciate your mercy and your grace that you continue, continue to love us and care for us no matter on our, our best day or our worst day. So Lord, we ask that you might just invite us into greater freedom and, and life and celebration of the kind of love you have for us in this world. We ask that we can be better at mirroring your love to those around us, that we can create a place of hospitality and welcoming and that people would know that they are in your presence when they are around us because we love like you love. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.